uh, up to two years to make sure that businesses, government, people are all ready for the, for the change. Uh, the second thing is uh, about treatment of, of uh, European citizens here. We're writing the treaty into the law and allowing British courts to take account of uh, what European courts do. Uh, and the, the third thing is we've said you know, we're going to meet our international responsibilities. Uh, one of those responsibilities is that the European Union, with us leaving, will have its complete budget structure dis disrupted because we're leaving in the middle of a budget and we're going to help put that right. Those are the three things, the three big things. Let, let me come to all of them then, bit by bit. Let's start with the money, which you've said in the past is the most difficult issue of all. Mm -hmm. Now, um, is it broadly speaking right that staying in for another two years, in effect, in the single market and paying to do that costs us about £20 billion? Pounds? Well, that's, if that's what, what we did, that, that's, that's what it would cost, roughly. We, about £10 billion a year net yeah. uh, is, is a number. But whether we do it that way or some other way, it will depend on negotiation. Um, now, there was another very, very interesting change in, in language, I thought, which was in the past the Prime Minister has said, and you've said, we will meet our legal obligations. And now we're saying that we will meet our commitments, so we will meet all the obligations that we entered into as EU members yeah. financially. And that could include things like pension contributions, it could uh, joint programmes uh, overseas, it could be um, structural funds in Italy going ahead and those kinds of things. Well, no, be careful. Michel Barney has said he wants detail on all of this. Oh, yes, I, know. I mean, look, whenever you have a negotiation, we're in the middle of a negotiation, mm -hmm. and we've had the most positive response to, to our initiative, the Prime Minister's initiative, that we've ever had. But, of course... Slightly chilly still. Oh, of course. It's a negotiation. You know, they'll always say we want more. There are two categories, if you like. Two categories. Number one, the current budget. Right, uh, that's going on at the moment. We're in the middle of that, and people have done things, started projects, and so on on the basis of that. We understand that. Beyond that, I mean, things like pensions and others. These are these are debatable to say the least, arguable to say the least. And indeed, the reason. But the that, prime minister, I'm sorry, what, the prime minister has said we will honour our commitments. On our yeah, honour our obligations and our commitments. Uh, but you know the, exactly what they are. I mean, you, the, the interpretation being put on. Uh, on this by the union is of course the maximalist one. We had this ridiculous number of 100 billion thrown out at the beginning. They put the kitchen sink in. If that's ridiculous, are we looking at 40 billion? <laughs> because that is the figure that's on yeah. the front pages. I know it is, uh, and, and th they sort of made that up too. Um, I'm not going to do an actual number on it, it would be ridiculous to do that. Um, but we have a fairly clear idea where we're going on this. Uh, but of course a lot of this is subject to legal challenge and debate, and that's what will happen. And to yeah. being absolutely clear, this is the very same money that Boris Johnson said they could go whistle for. <laughs> You'll have to ask Boris about that. I, it I'm, is the same money, isn't it? I, I, don't know what, I, I don't know what Boris was talking about there, but the simple truth is, Boris signed up to this. Boris was there uh, uh, on Friday his, his, saying, okay. look, you know, this is a good outcome, this is the right thing. So ask him, by all means. His but people are saying that his, famous, his now famous essay in the, in the Telegraph helped change the tone for this debate and he's had a big influence on it. Um, well, I have to say that the, the policy in the paper, the policy, sorry, in, in the Prime Minister's speech have been coming for a long time. I mean, some of them, the transition, we were designing right back in the beginning of the year. Uh, some of it we've been designing um, months ago. Uh, they, I don't think there's been any change of policy in the last few weeks. Did you, like Amber Rudd, look at this piece and think, aha, a bit of backseat driving? Did you think this was a helpful intervention <laughs> in the debate? My car's only got two seats. <laughs> yeah, but did you think it was a helpful intervention? Well, no, that's fine. It was on your programme, wasn't it? It was a very good interview, I thought. So you agree with her? It was backseat driving? Uh, I said it was a good interview. Yeah. On the rights of UK citizens, the Prime Minister said in Florence that they were going to have the same rights as they have now. Did she mean that? Because there has been a debate about well, this in some areas. If I was an EU citizen and I married somebody who was also a EU citizen or, some, or from somewhere else, I could bring them to this country without challenge. If I'm British and I marry somebody from Ethiopia, I can't exactly. bring them to that country. Exactly. So there's exactly. a difference. That's and do they keep those extra rights no, we, after... No, that, this is still subject to negotiation, but no, in the, in the long run that won't happen. I mean, we have got to get to a situation where British, uh, British citizens and the three million or so Europeans who are here are on, uh, on a level standing. Uh, but as I say, we're negotiating how we can solve the biggest issues here. Um, and on the same issue, the Prime Minister said that British courts would yeah. take account of European Court of Justice rulings and jurisdiction. Mr Barnier and his team have said we must be under the ECJ's yeah, well, jurisdiction. That's not so going to happen. What, what does take account mean? That's not going to happen. If you've got, um, basically we, the aim with the withdrawal treaty will be to have uh, British citizens and 
uh, in Europe and European citizens in Britain treated broadly similarly. You know, they won't be exactly the same because they're in different countries under different legal systems, but they are as similarly as we can. We are not, under any circumstances, going to be accepting the uh, overarching supremacy of the European Court. That's going. But British judges will be required by law, presumably, when they're uh, engaging well, some allowed, of these cases... Allowed, I think, is probably a better word. I mean, the, to watch. But they're allowed at yeah, the moment. Yeah, know, so it's, it must but, go beyond but we're that. Making that explicit. We're making that explicit. The point about it is we're making that explicit. Uh, we will allow the judges to interpret the treaty, if you like, in the courts. Um, but, uh, uh, and in that respect, they would, of course, naturally look at European Union decisions. OK, let's look again at the big picture, if you might. March 2019, mm -hmm. we leave the EU. Yep. But if you look around in March 2019, when it comes to free movement of people, when it comes to the amount of money we're paying into the EU, and it comes to EU regulations, not much will have changed. You won't be able to spot any great difference. Uh, the, well, that's a, the part of the, the, the purpose of the implementation period, is to give people time so to, that's to true. adjust. Yeah. Um, now, well, take, take the, uh, the, the free movement issue. And this will, I'm sure this will be controversial. We'll be debating this in the, uh, in the negotiation. But what we've said is we want registration. We want to register people who and come And they've in. said no already. Yeah. And well, we'll see. They, 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 they will get, we'll get to that point uh, when, when we actually negotiate the implementation period. So we are going to yeah. register every non-British EU citizen New living British. here or just people coming in coming for the first time? Coming in. And they're going to have to sign up. The EU says that is against European law because it is discriminatory. Well, well actually, uh, one, uh, we'll, be, we'll be outside the European law by then, so this is a question of negotiation um, uh, and maybe comes under the arbitration we talked about before. But that's the intention. All right, let's talk about the, again, the big picture when it comes to sort of trade and so forth. There seems to be a real problem between those people who want to stay as close as possible to the EU to get frictionless access to the markets, if you like, to be part of the EU's magnetic force field, and those who say, no, we want to break away completely and look at the rest of the world. Where on that spectrum are you? Oh, I'm bang in the middle, I should think. The oh, boring. <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd think that. Look, the issue will be to what extent and how our regulations in the UK affecting markets will be similar to those in the EU. The truth is we start at exactly the same position, that's what we keep saying this, we're exactly the same place, but we'll manage the divergence. And presumably we have to diverge or there's no point in leaving. No, of course we will diverge, we'll do things our own way. But as we diverge, we can't have frictionless access to the European market, can we? Well, you say that. I mean, the the first thing to say is, I mean, does does the do these changes, any changes we put in place, actually affect the competitive balance between the UK and the EU? And indeed, on their side too, if they change something, let's imagine. I mean, this, this won't happen, but let's imagine they suddenly decide they're going to subsidise lots of industries. We'd have an objection to that. That's where this arbitration panel would come in. We say, no, 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 you can't do that. Or if you do, then there's a cost to it. Now that's where it ceases to be frictionless. Uh, if if some one side misbehaves, as it were, in uh, with respect to the other. But generally speaking, uh, there are plenty of trade deals where you've got frictionless trade, uh, which is uh, subject to overarching rules, but uh, nevertheless you leave the, 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 the government in charge of its own business, as it were. Looking back at the, the Florence speech, was there anything in it at all that couldn't have been said a year ago? Haven't you wasted a year as a government? Oh, on the contrary. I mean, bear in mind we're in the middle of a negotiation, and that negotiation is ongoing. There, there are times when, it, when you, you test each other's metal, and that takes time. You triggered Article 50 pretty quickly, and then almost nothing visibly seems to have moved in, in the negotiation process, well, except they haven't given up anything. We've given up quite a lot. Well, that's not, that's not true. And you, you, you'll see, I mean, you'll see it. I mean, better to judge this uh, near the end than the beginning. This is a two-year negotiation, 19 months of negotiation. Yeah. So what do you say to a keen Brexit voter who said five years after the vote, we will still, in effect, be pretty, pretty much inside the EU, paying in money with free movement? No, that's not true. I mean, firstly, in 2019, we will leave. We'll come out from under the, uh, the jurisdiction and the lawmaking of the European Union. We'll have a couple of years which allows people to adapt. Most of the people who voted Brexit will say to you, we want a practical, upbeat, real, effective Brexit. That's what we're going to get. David Davis, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.